So my charge this morning from Greg is to discuss transparency as viewed through the peculiar lens of the law. So transparency offers the neoliberal ideal of a kind of spontaneous and beneficial order produced through individual empowerment, which is produced in turn by information. It's a central goal of reformers across a range of ideologies. It follows a simple logic. If corporations are transparent in their actions, they will be rewarded or punished by consumers or other counterparties. Transparency mandated by the state is not laissez-faire, but it's one step removed from laissez-faire because it shares something in common with that approach, consumer self-protection. Transparency can serve as a substitute for direct substantive regulation in its ideal form. Um, the state doesn't need then in this articulation, in this uh, 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 neoliberal uh, guise, to set a minimum standard for uh, a corporate behavior because the public will do so when it is duly informed of the corporation's behavior. So in this theory, if sunlight is the best disinfectant, as lawyers in the United States are wont to say, then transparency alone might yield the appropriate policy outcome without need for more direct state intervention. The logic, of course, relies upon the ability of a supposedly informed public to respond appropriately and change behave, the behavior of corporations. So uh, my goal this morning is to describe how transparency is produced by the law by looking at a few um, episodes, a few moments in, in how this is done. Um, and then to also describe the way transparency is produced in corporations through other means. And then finally to describe some of the limitations of this approach. So I've got a lot to cover and I'll do so pretty rapidly. So I, I'll begin here by the concept of producing transparency through law, manufacturing transparency through legal mandates. Sorry here. So the first and most obvious place to begin in the United States is securities law. If you register to sell to the public securities, that is stocks and bonds, then you have to tell investors what they need to know about the investment. That actually is a very serious mandate. It's enforced by criminal and civil sanctions, by private lawsuits that terrify corporations across the world. So it's a very serious disclosure obligation. But remember, it's limited. It's limited to informing investors what they need to know about the corporation. There's no transparency obligation that says you need to tell consumers everything they might want to know that might be of material interest to, uh, to consumers or environmental activists. Now, perhaps we learn about the environment and we learn about things that affect consumer health through the issues that affect investment quality, the, the value of an investment. So that's, uh, that there's a secondary possibility, an indirect transparency created that might be more public interested um, through this basic disclosure obligation. In the 1970s, faced with massive revelations of American corporate corruption around the world, the way that American companies like Lockheed had bribed heads of state, princes in Europe, uh, et cetera, um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, extensive gifts. Um, to obtain public uh, contracts, the United States passed what was then called the foreign what what was the, is called I should say the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is a, a, a is a transparency regime in part because it piggybacks upon the securities laws. So the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act says if you are an American company operating overseas, you have to. Uh, disclose corrupt payments and also that you can't make corrupt payments. Okay, so, so the disclosure obligation is actually crucial here because this links back to the securities law disclosure obligation. 
So the idea in the securities law is that if you sell uh, securities to the public in the United States, you have to let them know what might be in of interest to them. And here, the, uh, the kind of jurisdictional hook that's used is that if you're selling securities to, to American investors, you have to tell them you are, might be making corrupt payments. So the securities law simply requires a bookkeeping regime that it imposes upon you an obligation to say what you are doing with respect to corrupt payments. It doesn't actually ban the payment of corrupt payments in that part of the securities law. Okay, so there's a kind of interesting uh, uh, limitation. So uh, there's a bookkeeping requirement that you keep accurate books and records. So the practice of uh, dual uh, books is, uh, is then uh, problematic under this regime. Most recently, the securities law has been amended to require the disclosure of conflict minerals the use of conflict minerals in supply chains. So if you are, say, Apple Corporation, and your products use um, either tungsten, uh, gold, tin, um, and uh, tantalum, then, and you might be potentially sourcing your, uh, your minerals from uh, these kind of conflict countries around the DRC, then you may have an obligation to learn what's happening with your supply chain. Again, this is a disclosure obligation. It's not an obligation to avoid the use of conflict minerals. You can actually say on the front of your disclosure, we use lots of conflict minerals that uh, fund uh, the you know, fighting within the militias in, uh, in the DRC. That would be perfectly acceptable under this rule. Okay. But of course, the, the theory is that corporations will, be, uh, will abhor that, that disclosure. And in fact, what's happened is that corporations have routinely said, we don't know. So they have opted to say, we don't know where uh, our materials are coming from. We don't know whether, if, if they're coming from these places, whether they might be coming from the parts of those, of those places that are generating uh, income for, uh, for, for local militias. Um, it's a very complicated task. Um, the, the rule is that if you are contracting to manufacture using these minerals from covered countries, then you must conduct due diligence on the source, I should say, they got cut off here, and chain of custody of materials. Um, and so there's a complicated flowchart uh, that is available to determine exactly what you have to do. Uh, so I'll return to this uh, uh, conflict minerals disclosure shortly. Okay, so in Germany, we have, uh, we've seen here recently something titled uh, the Volkswagen uh, uh, diesel crisis. The, the fact that uh, Volkswagen was not transparent with respect to how its software operated when it ran these diesel engines. There is, an, uh, there is a really interesting element of German corporate law that you might have said might have changed some, uh, produced a different outcome. But let me talk about this. German law has what a principle of co-determination of the corporation. So large publicly held corporations must have equal representatives of labor and shareholders on their board. And you might have thought this creates an immense amount of transparency because it gives labor workers a seat inside the boardroom, literally as half the number of seats inside the boardroom. Okay. That's the, the German uh, requirement. And in fact, the Volkswagen Executive Committee had three out of five labor members. Okay. But here's, the, here's the, the difficulty. The, the labor representatives who had then a seat at the table apparently did not do enough, it, it appears, and at, nor did the rest of the board, I should say, uh, to ensure that the environmental interests were, were uh, properly accounted for uh, within the corporation's behavior.
In 2014, California passed the Transparency and Ch Supply Chains Act. Okay. So again, the use of the word transparency, uh, which signals that the idea is uh, not a substantive obligation for them to do something b beyond just telling us what they are doing. Okay. The, the obligation simply says, if you have um, annual worldwide gross receipts that exceed $100 million, and you are, quote, doing business in California, then you must disclose your efforts to eradicate slavery and human trafficking from your supply chain. That could simply mean, for example, that you disclose, you can literally write, we are doing nothing to help eradicate slavery and forced labor from our supply chain. But again, the theory is that uh, corporations will will not want to make such a disclosure and that they will then take efforts. This will actually spur efforts uh, to understand what's happening in their supply chain and to, uh, to remove human trafficking from the supply chain. Now, I, I looked at the Walmart policies, uh, Walmart disclosures under this. So, um, very interestingly, Walmart did change some of its policies in 2013, immediately after this statute takes effect. It says, we implemented policies in 2013 to address unauthorized subcontracting by Walmart suppliers. The worry in this context has largely been not only that the corporation would be hiring, uh, would be itself contracting with companies that use uh, forced labor, but that it would be further, those companies would further subcontract to other companies that would use forced labor in order to meet the immediate needs of a large order, for example. So uh, what does Walmart say about what it requires its suppliers? Suppliers must compensate, one of the fascinating bits here was what it says with respect to uh, wages that must be paid to the workers. Suppliers must compensate all workers with wages that meet or exceed legal standards or the collective bargaining agreements. Um, but it then it goes on to say, with respect to the living wage, suppliers are encouraged to, uh, to uh, pay a living wage. Uh, so this, is, this might be of, of interest because, uh, you know, given our uh, activism over the last uh, year, especially with respect to the increase in minimum wage, uh, the idea that uh, there's an encouragement versus the mandate uh, to suppliers to pay the minimum uh, wage should be, uh, is, a, is uh, fascinating. Another way that transparency is produced is outside uh, the, uh, the securities law, but through other uh, means. So for example, one of the systems that has been used recently with respect to information technology companies is through settlements with government agencies. So the Federal Trade Commission in 2011 had settlements with Google and Facebook uh, requiring 20 years of external privacy audits for Google and Facebook. Okay, so these are biannual uh, audits. Uh, that require that privacy controls are operating with sufficient effectiveness to provide reasonable assurance that the privacy of covered information is protected. Here, the, the settlements not only require uh, 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 an audit that requires uh, uh, disclosure to, uh, to the FTC, uh, a transparency obligation, but also goes further to require substantive compliance with the privacy uh, controls. Of course, we're familiar with the fact that law is not the only way to produce transparency. Um, and when you were talking about transparent corporations, we might look at the disclosures of Sony Pictures emails. Um, WikiLeaks decided to make these, uh, these emails all nicely, easily searchable. Uh, and so uh, taking the Reddit source uh, where it was first posted, um, and the really interesting thing about this uh, form of transparency is that whatever you think about the ethics of this disclosure, of this hack, um, uh, it actually has resulted in, in actual change. Uh, 
And here's the, uh, the, the example of this. Charlize Theron negotiates a $10 million raise after the Sony hack reveals that women are paid less when they work for Sony Pictures. Okay, a huge disparity between the stars. If you're a woman star, you are paid consistently millions of dollars less than your male co-star, who may be much less famous than you. Okay. Um, so we do see here, I think, an example of where transparency actually creates uh, actual change on the ground. And of course, there is the possibility of voluntary transparency. And uh, we have, uh, you, can, you can think of third party certification and labeling, uh, fair trade labeling, uh, green labels, et cetera, as a way to create transparency. Uh, asking a third party to come in and examine how your product is produced, to, to examine the su supply chain and certify that it actually meets a certain standard. The problem, of course, is that it's very difficult to know the value, the quality of the certification itself. Who certifies the certifiers? Who watches the watchers is the, is the uh, predicament here. And furthermore, whether this is actually having a great impact on consumer behavior. Uh, this, is a, this is an open question. Uh, you know, I think these are valuable uh, things to, to think about, uh, but I'm not sure that they have been, um, uh, they are as powerful uh, as, uh, as they might be or, or uh, as uh, utilized as they might be. One of the most interesting moves over 2009 and 2010 is the introduction of government transparency reports by information technology companies. Uh, so the Google in 2009, at the end of 2009, introduced something called the Google Transparency Report. Uh, the, so it's government transparency report, I should say. Um, and so, and this then was picked up by companies across the uh, Silicon Valley. Um, and so what this does is, that, is it tells the world what information is being shared by Google with uh, governments across the world. Okay. And also what kind of court orders uh, uh, Google is responding to. Now, these are highly comp complicated reports. Um, let me, if I can zoom in here. Sorry, just, sorry. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> my manager would like to access my calendar. Um, and, okay, well, so this, uh, this sh if you could read it, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Here we are. Um, it would show you that uh, there are a lot of companies, Google, Twitter, Microsoft, uh, Dropbox, LinkedIn, that are all being subjected to information requests across the world. So, uh, so a remarkable set of companies that are, are uh, being subjected to information requests. But the, oh, so I, oh, hurry up and finish up in, uh, in three minutes here. Um, so um, I will move on just to finish up here. Uh, voluntary transparency. Uh, one of the fascinating developments in this area also is uh, the use of what are called warrant canaries. Okay, so the government transparency reports are limited because sometimes corporations are specifically told you cannot tell anyone that this information has been requested. So corporations now are turning to what are called warrant canaries, where they say this, as of the last six months, we have not had any request uh, from the government that under this, uh, under su such and such statutory provision, for, for example. And then you're supposed to watch and see whether that sentence is repeated the next period. When that sentence disappears, when the canary dies, you know that something's happened. Okay? Um, and so, uh, so here, Apple has never received an order under Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act, for example, and various other uh, efforts to, to, uh, uh, to of these companies to actually get around, in some sense, the requirements of uh, these of, uh, uh, of the US government and other governments not to disclose. All right, uh, now 
very quickly here. I still, I'm going to turn to some of the limitations here. First, um, limitation. Well, basic, so we have laws that are uh, compelling some, some level of transparency, but we also have a whole host of laws that are reducing transparency. Consider basic physical trespass law, okay, that prevents you from walking inside. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen Michael Moore walking into uh, any corporation, the, the security guards come and shoo him out, right? Uh, uh, we've got trade secret law that, if, that protects uh, corporations and uh, their secrets. We've got non-disclosure agreements that uh, can be enforceable. We've got sometimes clauses barring reverse engineering, where engineers can't figure out what actually is going on, and those clauses might be enforceable, or it might even be, in some cases, a violation of, uh, of copyright law. Um, we've got attorney-client privilege, which is, of course, a, a, a rule that uh, I appreciate as a lawyer, uh, but, uh, but uh, reduces uh, the transparency of, uh, of things. Um, now, I wanted to just t show you how complicated, and this will strike everyone, the Europeans in particular, um, about uh, the, this is what Greg was getting to, the differences between the United States and other uh, countries. So you recall the... Uh, conflict minerals disclosure that I talked about. The conflict minerals disclosure was challenged by the National Association of Manufacturers as compelled speech and therefore a violation of their First Amendment rights, of their free speech rights. You are forcing them to disclose things. You are forcing them to say things. And the government can't force other people to say things, okay, including corporations. And this actually, this year, was, this challenge was, uh, was uh, sustained. Uh, it said the government's, the, the DC circuit, the District of uh, California, I'm sorry, the District of, uh, of uh, the District of uh, Columbia Circuit Court, uh, the federal district court uh, that uh, sits over Washington, DC, ruled that that conflict minerals disclosure was unconstitutional, that the government could not mandate that corporations disclose that they are potentially sourcing materials from places that might be uh, 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 fueling uh, uh, humanitarian crises. Now, the, the, the court rested this conclusion on an in, insufficient evidentiary uh, backing by Congress and the SEC in, in the rulemaking process. It said, the government's theory that disclosure will lead to amelioration of human, humanitarian crisis uh, is speculative, okay. uh, and so uh, it uh, it uh, struck that down. All right, now with uh, one minute left here, um, so there are there are a number of limits of transparency, some of which have already become uh, apparent. I think uh, sometimes the information that's disclosed can be very hard to understand or contextualize. If Volkswagen had made the software available. Could we have understood it? Would we have understood it? It's an open question as to whether or not uh, uh, hackers would have been able to uh, uh, figure out exactly what it was doing in those contexts. Um, it might alter behavior in unexpected ways. The argument of the DC Circuit is that the disclosure was actually harming the, uh, the Central uh, African uh, countries because it was leading uh, it was leading uh, American companies to avoid those areas entirely, okay? Or the companies that might be subject to the disclosure obligations to avoid those areas, thereby harming those countries overall. That's the, that was the theory, at least. Um, um, it can lead to omissions that obfuscate, for example, in the, the, uh, the gag orders from the governments to, with respect to companies like Google, and it, of course, might affect the privacy of individuals, um, as the Sony leak certainly did. Uh, okay, with that, I will stop. Thank you very much.